Army Delay. I'm from the Army Corps of Engineers, and I have the privilege and honor of being the moderator um, of this panel. And I think I think what I'll do is I'll just kind of introduce what this panel is all about, and uh, talk about the panelists a little bit, uh, just to introduce who they are, and then one by one I'll give a little bit more of a, of a complete biography, sort of the transition in between the speakers. Uh, I do want to, I think there are some uh, three by five cards that will be passed out. Uh, hopefully we'll have time. Uh, I'm actually a pretty good moderator. Uh, being in the Army, I know, you know I have, I've learned a lot of close quarters combat skills. So I, I just warned the, warned the panelists not to talk too long. Uh, because I'll sneak up on them. But, um, of course, I'm kidding, but there are three by five cards, so if you have a burning question as, uh, as we work through this, uh, please put it on the card and then uh, we'll, we'll address those questions at the end. And I'll ask the folks on MWA to keep me, I'm not even sure how much time I have now, I know we were late downstairs, so, so just to kind of keep me, uh, give, give me some warnings on the amount of time we have uh, for this total panel, I know it's supposed to be 75 minutes. So, so again, um, welcome to uh, panel number three. This is a plan to bring our harbor to life. I love that name. Wish I could take credit for it, but I can't. Um, really, really, this this is the idea. of This panel is to get excited about the comprehensive restoration uh, plan um, that I talked a little bit about uh, downstairs. I'm not going to steal uh, Lisa Barron's uh, thunder because she's going to tell you a little bit more about it. Just, just suffice it to say that we believe that um, a critical, really, linchpin of, of the environmental component of achieving the vision of a world-class harbor estuary uh, is successful execution of the comprehensive restoration plan. You know, a plan is good, but a plan doesn't represent action on the ground. It represents PowerPoint slides and uh, a whole bunch of booklets that really have nice and glossy pictures in it. So what we're going to talk about today is really ideas on the challenges, I think, and the, uh, the opportunities and the success stories uh, around the restoration and the harbor. And we're really lucky today to have the following uh, uh, five panelists, let say six panelists, um, to address that topic. And, and first, uh, just, you know, as I call your name, you, you've got your name tags in front of you, so hopefully everyone can see them. You've got Lisa Barron here from the Army Corps of Engineers, New York District. You've got Mark Gallagher from Princeton Hydro. And John McLaughlin, I think, is next, sitting in for uh, Angela Licata from the New York City Department of Environmental Protection. John, thanks for stepping up. I appreciate it. John Sacco from uh, the New Jersey Department of Environmental Protection. Dennis Laskowski from the Hudson River uh, Foundation. And then uh, Steve Zahn from the New York State Department of Environmental <coughs> Conservation. And as I said, I'll introduce each one uh, with a, a short biography to transition. So first, I'm just going to go ahead and turn it over to Lisa Barron. Lisa, Lisa Barron is a project manager with the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers in New York District. Um, her duties as part of the Harbor Programs Branch include um, the Comprehensive Restoration Plan, and Lisa is the chair of the Harbor Estuary Programs Restoration Work Group, which is charged with the management of implementation and implementation of the Comprehensive Restoration Plan with many partners, agencies, and stakeholders uh, around the region. She's got 19 years of experience, which includes ecosystem restoration initiatives, dredge material management, environmental dredging, remedial investigations, and ecological risk assessment. So, Lisa, thanks for coming, and it's all yours. All right, thanks, sir. Okay. Right. As, as Colonel said, you know, this is this session is about the Comprehensive Restoration Plan. We heard a lot about it today, peppered throughout the discussion of the 
what the today's conference is on the waterfront restoration plan, but you know, as we advance all of the goals, we need to integrate the two. And so, you know, pretty glossy reports, but we need to uh, move the action forward. And the only way this is going to happen, obviously, by all of the partners and, and agencies and stakeholders that are in the room and have worked with this, worked on this program uh, and developing the plan, and over 60 organizations worked on it. And Colonel already said the Port Authority of New York, New Jersey is our local sponsor. But what I think is um, really important that most of these organizations are part of the Harbor Restory Program, and that this plan is was adopted by the Harbor Restory Program. So it's really important that all the agencies and everyone has bought into it as the vision of moving forward, and which you know not only sets the goals as we move forward, but that, that everyone you know. And I think this is the first time this is you know not just the Corps plan. This is, this is everyone's plan to get behind it, and to, to, to work towards um, moving it forward. And you know, this is a living document, so you know, things are going to change. State of science is going to improve. Restoration opportunities, everything's going to change. So we got to keep that moving forward. And we're going to do that through the uh, through the Harbor Street Programs uh, pro um, Restoration Work Group. But one of the things that is important about this plan is that it also incorporates and identifies the ongoing restoration efforts by all the entities that are ongoing. So as you look at this, and make sure that you get a copy or leave, leave a business card so that you get a copy, um, but making sure that we've highlighted your program and the restoration efforts, because I think what's important is that we integrate and work together so that we can you know, uh, realize all the synergies that are, that are, that are able to be to, to move things forward. And one of the things building upon the Harbor Street Program's history is there's been a lot of sites that have been nominated. And so building upon that clearinghouse of restoration opportunities, the, the document and plan identifies all the restoration opportunities that are available. So whether you're doing restoration for the sake of restoration or you're a developer and you need mitigation, you know, this is the place to go for, for implementing and finding out restoration to move forward and identify all those ongoing restoration programs uh, that are taking place and advancing. And everybody knows, I don't think we really need to talk about the problems within this harbor, but actually, if you didn't realize, the, the, the system that we have out there, you know, it's an incredible resource, and it's the best water quality in the last 100 years, and everything's improving, we have a far way to go. And we need to you know, create, not just preserve, but create habitat whether it's you know to to rebound the 85 percent loss of wetlands, um, rebound the total loss of oyster reefs in this harbor or eelgrass beds, but to also improve our public access points and bring people down to the river and also have a clean clean environment. So handling those contaminated sediments is also imperative. So when you look at all of those problems, what are you going to restore? The target ecosystem characteristics. I mean, this is supposed to be a science-based program, a science-based report. So of course we had to have a long technical term for what our goals are. And so thank you, Hudson River Foundation, for our target ecosystem characteristics and Cornell University uh, to build upon and track down and figure out well, what are we really trying to restore. There were 11 priorities and targets. Basically, we call them text. And you know, all the habitat types that I mentioned, or whether it's improving the contaminated sediments, it identifies what are we trying to restore and by when. By 2015, by 2050, how much, what are our goals that we have something to achieve as we move forward? But also considering this is an urban environment and that we can only do so much. And, but, but moving forward and with, the, with the overall goal of creating a mosaic of habitat. So every parcel that we have, what can we do in that parcel? And how many different habitat types and what can we improve? And creating that mosaic. And so here's just an example of each plant each planning region, that there's eight of them in this, in this plan, but for Jamaica Bay, you know, looking at what kind of habitat we can improve. When, when you look at the waterfront plan, there are very similar reaches. I think there were 22 reaches that were identified in this. When you look at this, I just wanted to point out that one of the things that our next steps that we have to do is really look at the overlay of our properties and our footprints. And on the waterfront plan, here we have a great opportunity of doing an incredible amount of restoration. And you know, um, as you look at all the opportunities that are highlighted, we have one, one of the opportunities that are actual active restoration. 
And so I think that's our next thing. We need to move it forward um, and, and make sure that it's consistent and, and, they, and they build upon each other and reinforce each other. And I just have the lower Hudson River Plan region out there because it's a little bit it's very different than Jamaica Bay, which is more of our situation in our urban environments where we have pier structures, hard shorelines, bulkheads, and advancing those public access points. So we need to move those things forward. But our biggest, our biggest challenges to realizing restoration. And as Chris said, you know, we've got, Chris Ward said earlier, that you know, we have competing agendas and priorities, and we all need to work together to advance these challenges. But as we look at just ecological restoration, everything in this, everything in this plan is basically, you know, changing the habitat one way or the other, improving the habitat, but trying to overcome habitat exchange issues, fill issues, attract issues with contaminated sediments, all of these things which then also working with our regulatory agencies to streamline and make it more flexible, especially for the purposes of doing restoration. And our biggest challenge, of course, is funding. I mean, that was going to be talked about for how, you know, leveraging funding, moving, moving programs forward, using our existing programs and leveraging them as an opportunity to advance. It was mentioned on mitigation banking, making restoration predictable uh, for the developers and, and advancing those types of, uh, of Different mechanisms like natural resource damages. You know, John's going to talk. John's going to talk about NRG, um, and and trying to influence and include and incorporate these target goals in every development program and every project that we have on the waterfront, so that we can make everything um, make it as green as possible. So advancing all of those different things, and then because this is a part of the Hudson Rare and Estuary Feasibility Study, at the end of the day, we want programmatic authority. We've got to do a report that goes to Congress so that we can have new authority and moving federal dollars going forward. Um, and then also, you know, we've got success stories that people are going to talk about, but our Elders Marsh, West and East, and Garrison Creek, those are our great success stories. Recently, just completed the summer, advancing about 100 acres just in Jamaica Bay. But we want to do that more often. And, and lots of different places in the harbor. So with that, I'm going to end. And I don't know if I if I did my five minutes because he was giving me the book. But um, but what I wanted to do really famous. I apologize. But I think what I wanted to do was set the stage for everybody so that they can dive down into certain activities, certain aspects of all of these points uh, forward. So thank you. Said, 
And I think the Comprehensive Restoration Plan provides an excellent opportunity, or an excellent, it's an excellent document to guide all the restoration projects in the future. And my firm has really embraced its goals, and our problem has been that it hasn't been embraced by state, federal agencies, as well as federal resource agencies. And part of the problem is, as we've heard several times already, everyone's on different pages, everyone's dealing with different regulations and different agendas. One of our recommendations, uh, the colonel's here, is I'd love to see the restoration plan become a regional condition for all 404 permitting done within in this area. It might definitely help guide, or at least guide, restoration projects as it relates to this restoration plan. But here are stumbling blocks that the private sector encounters frequently. And you know, I, for one, and, and many of my clients would love to do more restoration, but it's often very difficult. Um, we have projects we've, we've used the restoration plan as the backdrop, essentially, for designs and encountered people that just haven't even heard of it, let alone embrace it. And even if it is embraced, it's going to require a fundamental shift in a lot of the regulations at various levels and a lot of our concepts on what race restoration is, especially in an urban environment. Some of our key issues, and I'm going to relate some of these to either restoration projects or mitigation banking, is credits and mitigation ratios. Habitat conversion is a major stumbling. For banks, it's a credit release schedule and a success criteria for a lot of these projects. I'm going to give an example, and it has some good elements to it, um, at least as a backdrop to describing the comprehensive restoration plan. And it's a brownfield and greenfield project that happened in Woodbridge, New Jersey, along the Arthur Kill. The site was a rail yard used by the Reading Railroad for about the past 80 years. You can see, you know, it looks pretty typical of a lot of the urban built sites in the estuary. Um, before they voted, it was all dominated by bright lights. And this is what it looks like today. It's been three years. Now, it's a private development project. The motivation for this project, you know, the private sector, they can make money on developing a bank. But part of the difference between the cost to build this at 1.2 million and the potential realized profit is because this was already under development. And a lot of the film material that is usually the big cost in doing restoration or mitigation projects in the estuary could be disposed of on site. So the high spot you see in the foreground with the cedar trees the fill generated from creating the wetland was placed there and became part of a reforestation project. That allowed the cost to become manageable. And our brownfield projects, as of now, typically go to the economic development component of the site rather than a greenfield development. It's an idea of costs. When an acre of upland port costs between $500,000 and a million dollars, it pretty much precludes wetland creation. And that goes to competition between port uses as well. So doing creation is not going to be common within the estuary. However, restoration or enhancement are viable options. The problem in New Jersey is wetland enhancement is at a ratio of three to one. And I'm going to go back to that Port Reading site. They have an additional seven acres that we proposed for restoration. And what happened, based on those ratios, it would have cost three and a half million dollars for that seven acres. All because that fill material that we would have removed to create an intertidal wetland had to be moved off site now. There was no more room to keep it on site. That means a wetland credit would be at 1.5 million for 2.3 credits. If we were allowed to even use the definition of restoration in this case, 
it would have brought it down to a million dollars. Now the problem is, it's a cost-benefit driver for these projects. A mitigation bank site, they're only allowed to get 10% of those credits upon signing of a banking resolution. So if that costs three and a half million dollars, they can only get 10% of the value of their credits up front. So it becomes a very risky venture. So this is one of the issues that makes it difficult for bankers to do mitigation banks in the estuary. If that initial credit release was higher, then their risk is lessened and it would foster more private money being spent to restore wellness. So what we're left with then is enhancement of weapons, and this tends to be restoration of achieving a minimum standard. It takes away any of the more ecologically valuable elements of a restoration project because they can't generate value from it. So weapon enhancement, again, pretty much in New Jersey, is you kill fragmites and replace it with a more desirable species. It doesn't speak to any enhancement for fish habitat or creating any other structural elements within a marsh that could be more ecologically valuable, such as many of those common elements embraced by the company's restoration plan. Habitat conversion is another problem. <clears throat> and I think a lot of this problem is based on regulations being focused on land development and not on restoration. I'll give you a simple example. The harbor herons are very important in the estuary. We have a lot of ditch wetlands. If we can reconfigure ditches or plug ditches and create more shallow water foraging habitat, that would be a benefit for wading birds. Because many of these sites, they look good, they have desirable plants, but there's very little feeding opportunity for foraging wading birds. That was looked at as a habitat conversion. So our focus on the functions of a marsh are often based on what the plant community is. No other element, and that's the same success criteria we have for mitigation sites. It's 85% cover by native plant species. We need to do more to integrate more elements of the comprehensive restoration plan into our restoration design. And that's where we need the regulatory agencies to embrace different elements of that plan. Um, the last one, and this is one that's a theme for my company, and I have to say that dam removals have been a battle in New Jersey because there is an, I think, unrealistic value to place land boundaries. But if dam removals can be looked at as restoring stream systems and repairing habitat and for mitigation, <coughs> There would be a, a, there'd be numerous options to remove small unused dams as part of habitat restoration. <coughs> and thank you very much. Seen those as a 
uh, coastal woodland restoration of the 400 acres. Uh, some work in Patica Basin, some work in Alley Creek. Um, so there's, there's a lot of projects moving forward, but I'll get to this. Um, the, you know, even though you know, we have the correct plan, and that's the, the plan for the future, it doesn't mean we're, we're not implementing um, projects right now. Um, the water quality, as not least mentioned, and others mentioned, the, has been the cleanest it's been in over 100 years. But again, this doesn't mean we stop there um, and we just call it a day. But since 2002, the city has spent about $6 billion in water quality improvement projects. And that only gets us to, to so far that we need to look at other natural systems maybe to get us past that need to occur. Um, and that's a as I mentioned, we're not, we're, not, we're not stopping with the way the crypt to be implemented. Those other projects are already moving forward. And uh, the estuary has changed dramatically over the last 150 years. I mean, uh, a lot of filling, a lot of uh, navigation channels have been put in. So the, we need to view the system in a new environmental context. You know, what was historically there doesn't mean we can place it there. Because conditions today are very different. So we need to view it in that new environmental context, look at science, look at new technology to get us ways to, to bring back some of that, you know, that green uh, green infrastructure back to our to do this place in voice of ads and eel grass. And the city has been, you know, installing pilots and many others, uh, some of the state have been also installing pilots to gain you know, and collect that information. So we, we are trying. Um, to do that. And part of the problem is you know, we need to be viewed as on, you know, on par with Chesapeake Bay, Great Lakes, you know, Lake Champlain. Uh, they receive a dedicated you know, stream of funding, uh, which is rather substantial in some cases. Uh, we don't quite have that level of funding here. But despite of that, we are leveraging quite a bit of funding with many departments of this state, um, to the DC, you know, the core, the Port Authority. New York City parks. You know, we all are moving forward. We are making the best of what we have. Um, but that shoestring budget, you know, at some point is going to break. We can only go so far. So we need to look at the. I don't know. The estuary is a very valuable, world-class estuary. You heard that uh, comment earlier. That you know, we need to bring that that same funding to make it commensurate with those other uh, water bodies, so that we can continue to restore uh, natural areas and bring back even. Great, we can move water quality. Is that my five minutes? Thanks, Jim. All right, let's give John a round of applause. Not bad. <laughs> I'd just like to point out to uh, Lisa and Mark that uh, John got us back on time. <laughs> <laughs> okay, great. I, I, I hesitate because I love to watch the musical chairs and that and stuff. Next, we've got, uh, we're privileged to have, uh, we're going all the way across the, uh, uh, the Hudson River here uh, uh, to, uh, to hear from a partner from New Jersey, uh, John Sacco. John is the Chief of uh, Office of National Resource Restoration in the New Jersey Department of Environmental Protection. Uh, John was originally trained as an estuarine uh, ecologist. It's hard to say. Uh, and John's got 22 years of experience in the, in the state of New Jersey working for the DEP, most of which has been spent working with remediation and restoration of hazardous sites and oil spills. <coughs> for the past nine years, he's administered the state's natural resource damage program, which assesses and restores injuries to the public resources. This program has protected over 8,000 acres habitat and open space and is restoring approximately 400 acres of salt marsh and fresh water wetlands. So John, thanks for joining us today. Look forward to hearing from you. Thank you, Carl.
story. Um, an example I'd like to give is that during an oil spill, oil may reach a salt marsh. The remediation of that oil would be to remove the substance from the salt marsh. If the marsh dies, it's another step to restore that marsh. That's what my program does. We've been at it now for about uh, maybe 20 years. Um, as the Colonel mentioned, um, we've, we were able to, um, in terms of uh, getting settlements for compensation for these natural resource injuries, we were able to uh, purchase and protect over 8,000 acres of uh, habitat and actual recharge areas in the state of New Jersey. Um, we've recovered uh, close to $100 million uh, since going back to 1992, I guess. And um, it's interesting that my office began, um, and I, I kind of tie that as well to the beginnings of the CRIP. Um, we were in, involved with the early spills in New York Harbor back in 1990, 1991. If you remember, um, there's the Exxon Bayway, uh, there's the Seabro Savannah, uh, and there were a couple other very large vessels that lost their cargoes in the harbor. And it all seemed to occur right after Exxon Valdez. Uh, so there's a lot of energy in the country, a lot of, a lot of uh, concerned people. A lot of legislation was passed at that time, and a very significant one as a result of Exxon Valdez was the Oil Pollution Act of 1990. And using some of the tenets of that legislation, as well as Jersey's own Spill Act, which is a pretty strong piece of legislation, um, we were able to pursue restoration of natural resource injuries for, uh, emanating from all those large harbor spills. Well, we ended up selling probably close to $25 million, and we worked with the city of New York, the state of New York, the Department of the Interior, Fish and Wildlife Service, and NOAA, National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. They're all trustees for the public's natural resources. We were able to recover this money, and all of a sudden, here we have $25 million to go out and do restoration in accordance with the Oil Pollution Act and our own state statutes. We honestly <clears throat> didn't have a great idea of how to get started. So what we did was go around the harbor and spoke, spoke to people like you. And it's, it's pretty cool because I've seen a lot of faces today that I saw 20 years ago when we were going around the harbor trying to figure out how we do restoration here. Those early days were really what I consider the beginning of what we have today in the, in the CRP. Um, a few years after the spill, EPA geared up and had the Harbor Estuary Program, which brought some more federal dollars into the planning aspect of, of restoring the harbor. And then, of course, a few years after that, we have all the great expertise and resources of the Corps of Engineers who pulled together everything uh, that was known in the harbor, including all that early work that we did come up with this uh, uh, comprehensive <coughs> restoration plan, which is truly is a comprehensive plan. Um, just wanted to share with you some of my experiences on living this plan. Um, as Lisa said, it is a living document. Um, it's a very iterative process. We're still out there talking to stakeholders all the time. Um, we're still uh, negotiating settlements uh, to restore natural resource interests. As a matter of fact, this last week, our comment period closed on a deal with El Paso Corporation that would remove three run-of-the-river dams in the Raritan. Our goal, of course, is to have the Raritan flow freely again and get a shad run all the way up to Clinton. So um, another piece of the harbor that goes all the way into the heart of New Jersey um, where we're, we've uh, been successful in doing some restoration following the tenets of, of the grid. Uh, there's just three, three projects I, I just wanted to talk to you about, just as some examples of, um, of our work in, in the harbor, uh, past, present, future. Um, upstream of the project that Mark mentioned is a, a Woodbridge River restoration project. And it was one of the early projects that we identified as a result of the Exxon Bayway spill in the 90s. It was about a 20-acre project um, upstream of uh, the Arthur Kill. And we worked um, very closely with the Corps of Engineers we had designed the project, we had conceptual designs, we had about 35% design. Corps of Engineers had um, an obligation to uh, mitigate for some uh, harbor deepening. 
and we combined forces and we were able to implement approximately 32 acre project um, that converted um, an old um, hydrologically impaired salt marsh that was all fragmented into native salt marsh vegetation. It was kind of the beginning of our, our relationship with the Corps of Engineers. Um, that project uh, was about 20, 20 acres, and it, we used approximately $4 million in natural resource damage to recovery to implement that. One, another project that we're just finishing up is um, you go up upstream from um, uh, Newark Bay there, the Hackensack River, number one in Swiss Bay. That's Lincoln Park. It's a Hudson County Park, and it was an 80-acre former landfill. And it, uh, the land was filled, it was formerly uh, flowed by tides, it was a salt marsh. And um, <clears throat> it was another project identified to work with stakeholders, with Hudson Parks, the Bay Keeper, uh, Bill Sheehan, the River Keeper, brought this piece to our attention. Hey, this is an 80 acre parcel, it'd be nice if we can restore a piece of this. Um, so we, we came up with a design and um, we, uh, we we're able to uh, secure some funding through another natural resource damage settlement. But as it turns out, we, we designed this thing as a Cadillac, and we had enough funding to build a uh, Volkswagen. So we we applied for the uh, stimulus package funds to the tune of about $11 million, and we were granted that much money. So we turned uh, you know, a, a three, $4 million pot of money into considerably more than that, and we were able to implement that, uh, that project. Um, we have our site set on Liberty State Park, and that's a, um, it's, we have a conceptual design. We work with Corps of Engineers uh, to come up with um, a wetland component. Uh, that's designed now. It's 100% design. We're looking to start construction break ground um, next spring. We also, there's a saltwater component, and, and the plan is to um, join the freshwater component to the Hudson River by restoring about 80 acres between uh, the river and this freshwater wetland project to make like a miniature ed estuary at Liberty Park. Commissioner uh, Martin <coughs> earlier this morning mentioned that uh, we're restoring about 250 acres in the harbor, and that's represented by these, these three projects. And we've committed close to $25 million in natural resource damage recoveries, added in the other uh, $10 million from the ARA stimulus package we're, we're up around $35 million of, of restoration projects in the harbor. So I just wanted to show you some pictures of, of Lincoln Park. Uh, it's the project on the, on the Hackensack that, that we're just finishing up. Um, five months ago, it was a dump. 80-acre um, landfill. What we did is, um, I don't have a pointer, but if you're looking from the plastic sky, we bridge downstream um, close to the north end of the site, which is uh, near the Pulaski Skyway, um, it's about 18 feet of landfill. And as you go south and downstream along the river, it thins out to about a two to three foot veneer of landfill. What we did was pull back the thin stuff, pile on top of the thick stuff, close it as a landfill, and then introduce tides into the um, into the uh, into that lower reach to the tune of about 40 acres. It was contaminated, so we had to undercut uh, the project by about two feet. We were able to work with the Corps and the Port to bring in about uh, 300,000 cubic yards of Ambrose sand to the project to use as a clean substrate. So we had a lot of these large government agencies working very nimbly um, to bring this project to, to fruition, and it was very nimble. I mean, we had, excuse me, maybe three months to put together an application for the stimulus package funding, and we were able to do it. Um, and a lot of credit goes to these very large agencies who really focus on, on getting this job done. Um, so here's what it looked like about, about five months ago. Um, and here's what it looks like now. Um, it's, a, it's a nice project. Um, we learned a lot from it. We were able to partner with a lot of, um, a lot of different entities, from the stakeholders to the large federal agencies. And we took this thing off in, in really a matter of months. We, we got this going in January last year, and here we are now. So it's a really nice story, uh, a, a lot of cooperation.
And just to close, I want to talk to, talk to you a little bit about our plans for Liberty State Park. This is another, another project we've been, work with the, we've been working with the Corps on. Um, they helped us with a, with a design for a freshwater component. If you look down um, to the lower right, you can see Liberty Science Center. It kind of looks like Oz there to the, uh, to the left of that slide. In front of that um, is a little blue area. That's, that's the freshwater wetland we've designed. And what we'd like to do is capture the stormwater runoff from Liberty Science Center bring it um, down to a little channel into that freshwater wetland and treat the water. Um, and then most of it will filter, it, filter off into the groundwater. But the future, um, we'd like to connect that to that little serpentine channel that you see coming off the Hudson River. And that's our saltwater marsh. Um, so all in all, we're, we're hoping to restore about 150 acres out here in combination with the freshwater, the saltwater, and some of the upland habitat in, in this area. Um, again, things that we learned at Lincoln Park can be applied here. It's a lot of contaminated fill. We have plans to use um, clean uh, channel um, dredge material as a substrate to, to cap the contaminated areas in the yard <coughs> communities going. So that's kind of um, my life with the trip. Um, it's, it's been a good one. It's been a long one. Um, but uh, you know, working with the community through the years, these are the kind of results that, that we've been able to attain. So, there you have it. Thank you, John.
further scientific uh, uh, exploration. Uh, and we, and, and, and also in looking at some of the challenges and the opportunities in implementing uh, individual projects uh, or collective uh, groups of projects, there, there were really three things that were, were things that you really needed to, to get a handle on and move ahead. One was to ensure that the science was right, I just talked about. The second is sort of the policy and the regulatory acceptance of what you're trying to do, which you know, some, some of these sort of legal issues um, and agency issues have heard a lot about which are very uh, difficult to work through. And the third piece, uh, which I want to talk a little bit more about, is sort of this idea of having restoration advocates. If people don't, if, if, a, if this plan doesn't resonate, well, we know it resonates with a lot of folks that are in the room. Uh, we continually preach to the choir. Uh, but if the plan doesn't really resonate, or projects don't resonate with the broader community, we don't think it's going to go uh, that far. And a good example of that, and I think if you if you go to the 210 session on oysters, um, you'll see the way that uh, the oysters have sort of captured the imagination of people, and there's like 18 different partners working on, on just an oyster research uh, project. Um, since we're talking about the waterfront today, uh, there, there, as Lisa mentioned, there, there are a couple of, uh, of these texts that relate to the waterfront. Uh, one in particular is, has to do with the creation of, of shallows, uh, re recreating shallow areas along our shorelines. And you know, again, I think we saw a lot of images this morning, uh, or heard from people give, presenting images that you know, we have a somewhat smaller uh, estuary, it's deeper, and you know, we have hardened shorelines, and it would be nice to get uh, sloping, softer shorelines, in some cases, in some cases, hardened shorelines, in some cases, enhancements. And we're really thrilled that uh, the, the TECs are, are being embedded in, in the city waterfront plan. And I think it, it provides a, a kind of a unique opportunity because that uh, as the waterfront gets maintained and recreated, uh, there's an opportunity to do restoration at the same time. And there seems to be quite a bit of interest and enthusiasm on the part of the city and EDC and others to, to make that happen. And so if restoration can be incorporated in individual projects, if the regulatory community accepts uh, the notions of, and, the, and the guidance that are contained in the grip, it makes for an easier regulatory process for Steve and others to, to work on. And then it becomes more palatable to talk to about things like the markers that we're getting at on, on mitigation banking. You know, starting off the discussion saying, I'd like to create a mitigation bank. Well, that's about as far as you can get in that conversation. But if you work yourself through a process that's logical um, and, and uh, there's nothing else to do, uh, mitigation banking makes a lot of sense. I want to go back to this idea again of, of this sort of restoration <coughs> advocates. And, you know, if you ask yourself a uh, question, uh, you know, do you have a memory and history of what the harbor once was, you know, that resonates uh, with today's society? Uh, you know, I think the answer to that is yes and no. And do we have restoration ideas that will benefit people in the harbor at the same time? I think the answer is definitely yes. You know, and again, one memory that uh, really resonates very clearly is that of bringing back oysters uh, to New York Harbor. Um, as uh, you know, Mark Polanski in both the Big Oyster uh, points out, New York was you know, the oyster capital of the world. Um, people were interested in, in, in oysters for stewardship purposes and for some restoration purposes, but at least in my observation, you know, having this book, The Big Oyster, out there rose to the consciousness of this little critter, and, and there was a, John Walden is the audience, there was a little meeting at the South Street Seaport jam packed with people who sort of like to talk about oysters and fish and listen to that kind of stuff, and um, one of the questions was that people don't really sort of understand what, what makes the oyster, you know, it's just put it on this pedestal, it's like it's kind of interesting and, and unique. Uh, but what's clear, though, is, is that, uh, as, as Kralinski pointed out, when, I'm sure there's, I'm not sure it's 100% true, but um, he, he says in his, in his book that when oysters were gone, you know, so was New York City's uh, connection to the sea uh, was lost as well. Um, and I think there's a lot of truth to that. And, and, and you know, it got me thinking about it, preparing for the talk. Um, you know, if we, if, if it's, if, if we do have, you know, the citizens of this region that really do um, want to buy into restoration, it's really important for them to have some connection in some way. And I thought about, uh, I did some, did a little work in looking at the sort of history of 
sewage and a variety of other things, you know, 100 years ago. And back in, you know, 100 years ago, there was another organization that had Metropolitan in its name, and it was uh, it was a sewage commission, and they were they were they were tasked by the state of New York to look at uh, ways of renewing sewer systems. But there was a guy that ran this called named uh, George Sober, um, and he spent a good part of 30 or 40 years of his life trying to convince the population of New York City that uh, if they needed to clean up New York Harbor, that uh, New York City, he was embarrassed uh, what New York City's waterfront looked like and the way New York City had kind of turned its back on the harbor. Um, and in one of his many essays that he, that, that he wrote um, in the New York Times, he, he talks about uh, New York waterfront offers like in, an incoming ocean traveler. Picture somebody on an ocean liner coming through the narrows and looking at the vistas of New York City. But boy, I want to use the word, it, it's enchanting to see that skyline, to look at that, uh, you know, the land, water, islands, and, and so forth. But he said as, as that ocean liner approaches the docks, uh, it reveals all the blemishes that exist there. Uh, he said there were drab docks with foul waters, what is new or in good repair wears a hard utilitarian aspect, and what is old and neglected is unsurpassed for ugliness. Um, and so that's that's what we, you know, it's, it's difficult to find uh, nice stories about what uh, uh, waterfront and uh, you know our shoreline uh, habitats were like without going back to reading Eric Sanderson's book uh, or hearing him talk about Manhattan going all the way back to the days that. Uh, when Henry Hudson sailed in. And there's one other thing that I ran across, and there was a quote um, in the paper. It was a paper by, some of you may know, Eunice Fuller Barnard. She was a, a, an educational editor at, at the New York Times, and uh, she worked at the Sloan uh, Foundation, involved in a whole lot of different issues, a lot of women's rights issues, women's rights issues, and so forth. And she wrote a, she, she wrote a, uh, an article about uh, what New York Harbor in New York City looked like at night. You know, and she, she talks about the lights and the things that you can see and everything else. But she starts off by describing New York and New York Harbor in this way. She says, New York is like an ungrateful daughter who turns her back on the mother to whom she owes all that she is and has been. She cherishes no memories of past sea prowess. She has no sacred codfish, no relics like those in the Boston Tea Party or the whaling museums that. that uh, that boast, uh, that are the boast of far west lesser ports of the Atlantic coast. Her coat of arms from the beginning has borne the inland beaver and the windmill. You know, if you ever look at New York State's flag, you see this thing something. Even her chief marine landmark, the Statue of Liberty, was the gift of France. So if you look back at our, you know, you try and get some nuggets out of, out of what may have been or what our past generations were thinking and, uh, and trying to connect you know, our daily lives with, with the harbor is very, very difficult. And I think that's a challenge and why we, we see different different attitudes in areas like Chesapeake Bay and, and, and others. Um, and one other thought I wanted to leave you with, last, last week I had the opportunity to teach a, an, an honors class at a, at a, um, uh, a college here in, in, in New York City. And I, I gave a little talk about the conditions in the harbor. And at one point, um, I was discussing uh, the declines in certain fish species, including shad. And you know, most of many of you may know that uh, the commercial and recreational shad fishery, the traditional fishery in the Hudson River in New York Harbor, was closed for the first time in human history this past year. And that sort of went by unnoticed by a lot of people. Um, but I mean, I know just from personal experiences that. that people that aren't even associated with the river sort of understood when the Four Scythias bloomed, the flower of Brooklyn, that the shad were on their way into the harbor and it was shad road season and so forth. Out of the 25 or so students, honor students, uh, uh, in that class, only one even heard, thought he knew what a shad was. Uh, so he wasn't sure whether it was a fish or not. So um, there's a lot of, you know, there's, there's a lot of discussion these days about shifting baselines and what are, you know, what this generation thinks should, uh, the, the future should be based on what their own past experiences are. And I think that from a
standpoint of some of these waterfront issues, we don't even have a pass to fall back on. So the, the creativity, I think, of the folks here in the, in the metropolitan region is going to be really necessary to, to move the rest of the region forward. So thank you.
and, and if we are able to create them, there's an even spottier record on maintaining them. So at the end of the day, we don't have a real strong guarantee of what the outcome is going to be, and that we'll have a net environmental positive. That becomes a challenge with trying to get regulators such as myself and my agency to say it's worth taking the risk in order to realize the mosaic of habitats that are, that are outlined in the grip. From an ecological perspective, the text make perfect, perfect sense. You would ideally have an environment that accommodates all of these types of habitats to realize a broad uh, swath of benefits and ecological functions that come with that. But we, are, we, do have to, we do have to be cautious because we do stand to potentially lose something in the process. Uh, one of the other texts uh, is the oysters that several people have spoken about them already. Uh, that creates what we call an attractive nuisance issue uh, because the water quality and the sediment quality within the harbor, though better than they've been in decades, still falls below target levels for things such as certifications for shell fishing uh, and for certain, and certain times of the year for, for even for bathing, for primary contact for folks. So by creating these, these uh, human access locations or shellfish restoration tax, you do have the potential of creating a, a situation that could result in uh, a health issue for people or for fish and wildlife. And we, we do need to be mindful of that. The big question is, can these issues be overcome? And it's a, there's, there's a range of answers to that that I personally feel is somewhere between maybe and probably. I don't think the answer is no. And I don't think the answer at this point is absolutely yes. I think it's somewhere in between. What do we need to do? Uh, Dennis mentioned one of the things I think